Hi, this is Don Forsyth. Thank you for joining me. What should our first topic in our analysis of groups be? Well, let's start at the beginning with something very basic. What is a group? Uh, how would we define a group in our analysis? And two related questions. What are the key characteristics of groups? We're going to examine many different kinds of groups with many different forms and functions, but when you encounter a group, what should you take note of? What are the key qualities to take into account? We'll review some of those key qualities and also deal with the question of types of groups. Develop a very simple taxonomy of groups so that we can get some handle on the, the great diversity of groups that exist at any given moment. Um, so, moving on. There are any number of definitions of group. Uh, Turner, for example, emphasized categorization as the key aspect of groups. Two or more individuals think of themselves as members of the same category. Communication might be critical. The members of the groups, they need to be in some kind of a communicative relationship with each other. Bales suggested what's critical is face-to-face -face groups, although with the proliferation of online groups, that's a bit of a dated definition. Uh, Marv Shaw, who was my mentor in the study of groups, suggested two or more persons who are interacting with one another in such a manner that each person influenced and is influenced by each other. Influence is critical to Marv. The APA Dictionary of Psychology stresses interaction. Kip Williams has probably the simplest definition of groups, just two or more people. Rupert Brown stresses once again identity. People recognize their members of a group and they identify with to some degree. Joe McGrath, interrelationships. Kurt Lewin, interdependence was critical. Forsyth um, recently has argued that a group is best defined as two or more individuals who are connected by and within social relationships. The details of that definition, two or more individuals. So a dyad can be a group part connected by some sort of relationships. In our case, we're stressing social relationships. Notice that those relationships are typically referred to as memberships. And I include that uh, within social relationships to create boundaries around groups. Since that distinguishes groups from networks, uh, networks typically are not boundaried. Uh, that uh, you can join a network simply by creating a relationship with another person. So no one really knows where a network begins and ends. And also, unlike categories, members are socially connected. So they simply don't have some characteristic that they share in common, such as eye color or occupation, that that relationship should be a social one. I, I should hasten to add, however, uh, that as social identity theory explains, people in many cases identify in a very strong way with social categories so much so that their membership in such categories despite the fact that they don't have interpersonal relations with the members of that category still have the same qualities as dynamic socially based groups um, groups obviously range in size um, i'm going to declare dyads as a group but I'm not going to ignore the fact that as groups change in size, so do their dynamics. One of the issues about size and groups is that the number of relationships needed to sustain a, a group increases astronomically as the group increases in size. So that the, by the time you have 50 people in a group, why well, you need over 1,200 relationships to link one member to another. This has created a discussion of what is the maximum size of a group for human beings with the recommendation by, by Robin Dunmar, the, the anthropologist, that in fact a group of about 150 is all we can possibly manage as human beings and that perhaps our brains develop the size that they are to keep track of the relationship information of a 150 person group. Um, size is also critically important in determining communication among group members. This is a particularly interesting diagram, I think, because it shows that as group size increases from, from one person one to, to eight, you know, in the wrong place, 
groups of three, four, five, and six, and eight, uh, you see that communication shifts. The person who speaks the most in these groups of varying sizes usually dominates the group over 30% of the communication by that person. But and then as the group increases in size, you see that communication becomes more and more imbalanced. So here in our triad, that individual, one individual speaks over 45% of the time, the next person speaks about 30% of the time, and the next person, well, about 25% of the time. But you see in an eight-person group, it becomes even more imbalanced. The first person is still has the floor most of the time, but then it drops dramatically. The next person speaking 25. The fourth dominant speaker down to 10. By the time you get to that last individual, why? They're hardly speaking at all in the group. So as groups increase in size, the, the quality of communication decreases if you expect groups to communicate equally across the members. In my own research, I also find that group size dramatically influences group processes. I study responsibility, so obviously in a two-person group, people tend to take more responsibility than in an eight-person group for their outcomes. In this particular case, that when group members were successful in dyads, they claimed more responsibility when the groups failed. In four-person groups, that reversed, so that actually in four-person groups, people took more responsibility, more of the blame for failure than success. Defining groups, I think we can say we're finished with that. Let's talk about how we describe groups. What characteristics should we consider? And here we'll, we'll consider five very briefly. Interaction, it's what people do in groups. Those of you who study leadership can recognize this classic distinction between relationship interaction and task interac interaction. Um, leaders, of course, are responsible for making sure that the group members' relationship and task needs are met. Groups are also goal-performing organizations, so the goals that they seek to achieve are fairly important, and in almost every case, you can identify uh, a group and its goal. Joe McGrath, in his famous, at least in group dynamics circles, uh, theory of group goals, distinguished between generative goals, executive goals, negotiating goals, and goals that in involve making a choice in his circumplex model. It can be simplified by identifying, generating, choosing, negotiating, and executing, as the book discusses in its table one, 1. 1.2. Interdependence. The, the group members are linked together somehow. They, are, they depend one upon the other. Um, those relationships don't necessarily have to be reciprocal. They don't have to be necessarily equal in strength. They vary quite a bit. Here's an example of uh, all the relationship. All the members of this group are linked, all in a relationship. But for example, in a hierarchical, hierarchically organized group, you can see that the relationships are very different. A influences B, C, and D, but B, C, and D neither influence each other, nor do they influence person A. In contrast, in a hierarchical group with some interdependence, we see that A is more influential than B, C, and D, but there's still some influence in return. Um, a perhaps would be the leader, and B, C, and D would be the followers who do have some influence on their follower, but not on their leader, but not on each other. Sequential in interdependence is that rare case where one person influences the next person who then influences the next person. So I'm not sure how interdependence is going to be structured, but there should be some connection between group members. But I did say the word structure, so that would be our next concept, that there is some underlying pattern of roles, norms, intermember relations that organize the group. In many cases, we can show that kind of structure with a group diagram that indicates, in this case, that Jessica is connected to many members of the group, as is Michael, but that some members of this group are, are tied more loosely overall to the group structure. The final characteristic we want to consider is the unity of the group, uh, group cohesion. Uh, it's, it's best to consider cohesion to be a complicated concept with many facets. And uh, later on in our analysis groups, we'll talk about at least five of them. Social task, collective, emotional, and structural cohesion. Taking those five characteristics into account, how can we classify groups? Uh, how, how can we 
looking at all the millions of groups there are on the planet, how can we place them into basic categories? That's not easy to do. And of course, it's not as clean as this chart suggests, but I propose that the four fundamental categories are primary groups, social groups, collectives, and categories. Uh, here's some examples of such groups. But in this case, we're not just trying to categorize, but also think about how they are perceived. The concept of entitativity in group dynamics is not precisely the same as cohesiveness. Cohesiveness is the actual unity of a group. Cohes entitativity is the apparent cohesiveness of a group or the unity of an assemblage of individuals. It's a perceptual thing. It's what does the group look like sometimes to the members, but sometimes to outside members, and out individuals who are outside of the group. Uh, it does turn out that perceptions of entitivity correspond fairly well to our, our taxonomy of groups. So that when researchers, Brian Lakell, Dave Hamilton, Jim Sherman, and their colleagues studied entitivity, they did find that people, when looking at these sorts of groups, and estimating how groupy they were, did come up with these same basic categories. Some seem to be very primary groups, in which individuals are closely connected. Social groups are ones which still have strong relationships among members, but they aren't necessarily as long-lasting, nor are they as intimate. Uh, a collective is a more transitory group, one that forms and perhaps may disband as well, and the members may not know each other particularly well. And a larger group, a category, means that there's some characteristic shared in common among the, the group members. But in many cases, the group members will not interact with each other. That about wraps up our analysis of this first topic, the nature of groups. We've defined them, we've described them, we've classified them, we've discussed the ways people perceive them. In the next, se next presentation of our analysis of group, we'll turn to the nature of group dynamics. Thank you for your attention.